Well, thank you, Claudia, and, uh, and thank you very much, all of you, for coming out on this uh, very warm and humid night. I guess that uh, it beats coming out in a winter storm, like I understand uh, you, you've had uh, during one, one, uh, one of these uh, this past winter. You know, in uh, just 16 days, the 156th Iowa State Fair will commence. And uh, as many of you know, it's one of the thousand places to see before you die. It's ranked second as a tourism, summer tourism uh, uh, must do uh, in, in the United States. Uh, first was Las Vegas, according to USA Week, Weekend uh, uh, paper. And uh, the Wall Street Journal has uh, ranked the Iowa State Fair one of the top three uh, uh, fairs or expositions in, in the North America. And as we look forward to Iowa's great annual celebration, I think it's proper that we put the fair into perspective with reference to Iowa and national events during the past 156 years. Iowa became a state in 1846, and in the same year, Grinnell College was established as the first institution of higher education in Iowa. In 1847, the University of Iowa was established, but just eight short years after Iowa was admitted to the Union, our forefathers determined that a statewide agricultural event should be held. In 1854, the first Iowa State Fair was held in Fairfield. Think of it, six years before Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. Now consider this. The Amana Colonies were founded in 1855. The Spirit Lake Massacre was in 1857. The Civil War was from 1861 to 1865. And the railroad did not finish crossing Iowa until 1867. And one more little tidbit is, is that the Battle of the Little Bighorn with General Custer occurred in 1876. By this time, there had been 22 Iowa State Fairs held. So from that initiative in 1854, the fair has become an integral part of Iowa, her spirit, her pride, her heritage, and her culture. It's a very significant part of our infrastructure and important vehicle for economic development, tourism, education, and recreation. Now, the fair traveled around eastern Iowa for a number of years, from Fairfield, Dubuque, Davenport, Cedar Rapids, etc., before settling in Des Moines in 1878, where it was located at about uh, 30th and, and Grand Avenue up there. And in 1884, the legislature appropriated $50,000 contingent on the city of Des Moines obtaining a matching amount to purchase and construct a new fairgrounds. That $50,000 was raised from the railroad. The current location was purchased and the rest is history. The first fair was held on the newly purchased fairground site in 1867, or 1886, pardon me, and 67 buildings were constructed. Pioneer Hall was the first building and it served as an exhibition center for most competitive events from livestock shows to ag product demonstrations, etc. And of those original buildings, only Pioneer Hall remains today. In the late 1890s, a master plan was developed, and the construction of all the major buildings that we recognize today followed that master plan. Most were constructed prior to World War I. And during that period of 1884 through 1920, a 36-year period, there were great efforts, an ambitious spirit, and a deep pride in creating a facility worthy of being called the Iowa State Fair's home, the fairgrounds. The workmanship, pride, and vision of our forefathers resulted in the beautiful buildings and grounds now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And remember the railroad's role in the, uh, acquiring the site? Well, during that period, 90 trains a day brought Iowans to the fairgrounds from all parts of Iowa to see their beloved Iowa State Fair. And then a new spirit seemed to prevail, one of apathy, one of taking the fair and her facilities for granted. And over the next 70 years, there was minimal financial support for proper maintenance and upkeep of the fairgrounds and her buildings. Although the state of Iowa owned the fairgrounds, the legislature and political leaders provided only a pittance of assistance. So by 1990, many buildings were facing possible closure without immediate attention. 
Several legislators urged a feasibility study on moving the fairgrounds to other locations around Des Moines. Maybe some of you remember that they uh, had thought about putting it out at the junction of Interstate 80 and 235 in that area. The state of Iowa had little or no funds available for any appropriations, but in 1991, the legislature did provide for the establishment of a vehicle for raising funds for the renovation and repair of the fairgrounds. This vehicle would become the Iowa State Fair Blue Ribbon Foundation. And I was honored to be asked to lead those efforts in December of 1992 and on February 1st of 1993, the Blue Ribbon Foundation was born. We were immediately challenged by a $500,000 contingency pledged by Pioneer Hybrid if we could raise $6 million by the end of 1994, about a 16-month period. At the same time, the Fair Board set a goal for the foundation to raise over $30 million, or $30 million by the year 2000. The first thing that we did was to go to the legislature and ask for a tax checkoff a line on the income tax form, for, and they provided that. At the same time, we had to educate Iowans on the needs and importance of preserving our historic fairgrounds. And naturally, our most important hook was historic preservation. So we became, began calling on major Iowa corporations and individuals, and they responded very generously. Simultaneously, we developed a number of different giving programs which provided opportunities for everybody to give and feel a part of our cause and a little ownership. And in doing so, we paid particular attention to the fact that everybody who attends the fair has their own special area of interest or focus. The bricks, the trees, the benches, and the grandstand programs have served that purpose very well. In addition, we applied for and received a $1,250,000 federal grant through the ICE-T program for beautification. That money went into the renovation of the grandstand. Three months before the end of 1994, the Blue Ribbon Foundation had generated revenue of nearly $7 million, thus meeting the contingency pledge of Pioneer. And while continuing our solicitation of corporate and private monies, we felt strongly that since the Iowa State Fair is a state institution, that the legislature should step up to bat. Again, education became a huge factor. Many legislators did not realize that the fairgrounds belongs to the state. Many of them were not aware of the importance of the fair to many of their constituents. So we waged a war on fair illiteracy. We enlisted, we enlisted our supporters in postcard campaigns directed towards their respective legislators. We targeted legislative leaders and challenged them to be catalysts. We emphasized nonpartisanship, and we went overboard to recognize those who were helping us in the legislature through our newsletters and any other way we could. We showed them our role of donors, and we asked them to prove to thousands upon thousands of Iowans that their private contributions were meaningful by answering with significant state appropriations. And they have become educated. And they have responded generously since 1995 because they have realized how important the Iowa State Fair is to Iowans. Through these appropriations, grants, individual and corporate contributions, the Blue Ribbon Foundation, as Claudia mentioned, has generated over $80 million to date. And in each of the past three years, over one million folks have attended the Iowa State Fair. When the population is, of Iowa is only about three million, that's a pretty significant percentage. But there's much more to the fair and its home, the 440-acre fairgrounds, than just the 11-day run of the fair itself. During the interim, there are over 150 events comprising more than 500 event days each year. Horse shows, car shows, trade shows, rodeos, national cattle shows, art shows, flea markets, kid fests, and many more events utilize our wonderful, wonderful facilities throughout the year. And if you've not attended the fair recently, you've noted some great progress. While the improvements have been ongoing since the foundation began, many of the highest priorities were things that were not visible, new roofs, sewers, electrical upgrades, etc. But now it's all coming together. Nearly every major building on the fairgrounds has been renovated and new buildings have been constructed. A new old mill, a renovated Pioneer Hall, new Pella Plaza, many new restroom facilities, a world-class cattle barn, 
new cattle tie-outs, new shower rooms at the campgrounds, new camping facilities, renovated swine barn, 4-H exhibit building, sheep barn, horse barn, improvements to all of our free stages, new concessionaires campground, new sound systems, new streets, new lighting, renovated and modernized administration building, new service center, renovated and refurbished grandstand, new benches, trees, and sidewalks, enclosed, climatized, very, uh, William C. Knapp varied industries building. And in addition, over the past four years, we've constructed a new interactive museum, renovated the old museum, built an animal learning center, the Paul Knapp Learning Center, renovated and renamed the Drab Old Blue Tourism Building, now the Elwell Family Food Center, constructed the Susan Knapp Amphitheater, created a little hands on the farm attraction, and we've expanded the fairgrounds by acquiring all the homes and businesses in that four square block area in the southwest corner of the fairgrounds. And on August 12th, we will dedicate the Jacobson Exhibition Center, a 100,000 square foot state-of-the-art arena, which will accommodate horse and livestock shows, rodeos, concerts, and trade shows. This facility will greatly increase our competitiveness in acquiring large national livestock events for our fairgrounds in Des Moines and Iowa. For example, in, in October, we will be hosting the World Pergeron Draft Horse Congress, an event which is held in alternate years between sites in the United States and Canada. We are hopeful that the Pergeron organization will make the Iowa State Fairgrounds their permanent United States site. This event is an example of the economic impact the Iowa State Fair has on Iowa. It is estimated there will be over a thousand of these Pergeron horses entered. The event will last nearly a week and it is reasonable to project that each horse will bring at least three people with them. And those people will stay in hotels, eat at our restaurants, and fill their vehicles with fuel. The most recent economic impact study of the affair was conducted way back in 1995. At that time, it was estimated the fair's operations had an impact of over $52 million to Iowa, while supporting 2,700 jobs representing 21 million in earnings and 2 million in taxes. I can only imagine what that impact would say today. 15 years later. The Iowa State Fair is truly one of Iowa's greatest treasures. It is a vibrant, living legend that is immense in its scope and resilience. No other event is more revered or has stood the test of time better. It provides a means for showcasing the talents of both individuals and businesses. It brings Iowa, Iowa's people together in a spirit of cooperation, competition, compassion, and camaraderie. It, the, the fair fulfills dreams, captures imagination, and bolsters the morale of young and old alike. And I've been humbled by Iowa's love for this venerable institution, this Iowa State Fair, and I've been honored to share our story with you tonight. Thank you. I understand that uh, I, um, I can have to subject myself to questions, so, <laughs> so I'm happy to answer any questions if I can answer them or, uh, you know. Claudia? How many, how many of you have actually been up in those campgrounds in recent years? Not, not too many of you. Uh, th I, I've said before that I don't, honestly don't believe you understand the Iowa State Fair unless you've been up through, through, driven through those campgrounds. You know, we estimate there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 people up there all during the fair. Uh, to get in the campgrounds, we, we continually try to uh, uh, expand the campgrounds and provide for, for more uh, uh, sites for campers, but it's the average weight, weight on the list is six years to get in there. And uh, y you know, a, a good way to see it is to get on that uh, Lions Club tram, the Clearfield Lions, and just ride up through it. Just make a circle up through there. And you, 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 will, you will understand the fare when you see that. And those folks pay to get in every day. And most of them will be set up and, and uh, occupying their their units a week before the fair starts. 
and and uh, they take vacations they to to, to be at the fair uh, it, it's just amazing it's uh, so you know it's a, it's a It's really a treat to see, and it's uh, it, it really is something, you know. Pardon me. I have uh, I have three. There's the the Blue Ribbon Foundation is responsible for uh, uh, three major uh, areas. One is, is, of course, we're we're in charge of raising the or, or the uh, capital. Uh, the capital to renovate and preserve the fairgrounds. Secondly, we're in charge of all the sponsorships. We negotiate all the sponsorships with the, the Anderson Ericsons, the beer companies, uh, whoever you know, whoever we can. Uh, we uh, and the third thing is we're in charge of government relations for the fair. And so I have one young lady that's a, my our sponsorship director, and I have an assistant director. And I have a communications director, so there's four of us in total. And then in the summertime, we hire uh, three interns, summer interns, and then we also at the fair. Our responsibilities are all the merchandise, all the official Iowa State Fair merchandise, all the water that is sold is is our responsibility and, and a money maker for us. And uh, and then we uh, this year we're. We're going to be uh, overseeing that f uh, the new fair food uh, fair square, and so uh, so we 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 have a number of summer employees, you know. Who, who elects the uh, fair board? How many people are on the fair board? How do they get elected? How long they There's 12 uh, members of the fair board. 12 uh, and. And actually, there's 15, but there's 12 elected members. And then there's the governor of Iowa, the president of Iowa State University, and the secretary of agriculture. And you, you know, most always they send a representative. So there's actually 15, but there's 12 elected, and they're elected by uh, soil conservation districts. And uh, there is there are six of those across Iowa, and they're pretty evenly distributed. I mean, uh, pretty evenly placed, and uh, and they have uh, each has about uh, what uh, 16, 17 counties per soil conservation districts, and so you have to uh, and and they're, they're elected in alternate years. There's two two from each district, and every other year you have to run for re-election, and it's a two-year term. So so uh, the <clears throat> and they have to be elected by. The presidents or a representative of the 16 or 17 county fairs in in that particular district. They have an annual convention once a you know down here at uh, uh, in Des Moines, and uh, it, it, that's where they conduct their elections. We do have a lot of people that have uh, you know there's been we've got a lot of some people that have been on there a long time. But you know, uh, there's been talk about having term limits, and uh, the, the thing is, is that the term limit is they're all they're up for election every two years, you know, and and all they have to do is nominate somebody. But but for the most part, when they if they do a good job, uh, they they can stay on there a while. What plans do you see for the fair about ten years out? Well, I, you know, we're we're going to try to. Uh, maintain our agricultural roots. You know, so many fairs are going to the, to the, uh, you know, uh, what do I want to say? The adventure land type of uh, of entertainment and and uh, venue. Uh, we want to make sure that we keep the Iowa State Fair uh, uh, a lot of 
very much agriculturally oriented. And, you know, I think that the, one of the things we, we have, uh, we have actually two major buildings in terms of that. We have two major buildings that we're, we're going to address next. And one of them is the cultural center. And thanks to a, to a very generous contribution from Patty and Jim County, we'll, that'll be one of our very high priorities. Uh, you know, I see us uh, um, doing a much better job of marketing our facilities. I, I think we'll put a lot of emphasis on that in the next, you know, we're already trying to. But I think there'll be a huge emphasis on that because we do have a, a beautiful, a beautiful uh, fairgrounds now, and and many buildings that are climatized and and uh, it, you know I'm not sure I'm answering your question, uh, you know as to how I see, I see the as to how I see the future, uh, you, you know I think that one thing that we're faced with is there's so many Iowa kids that are only one generation removed from the farm and yet have never been on the farm. And we want to make sure that we, we provide the opportunity for them to learn through like the Animal Learning Center where we do all that farrowing of pigs and calving cows and hatching chicks and, and that little hands on the farm that teaches them how, what happens with the a, with a, uh, seed that they plant. And um, so we want to provide that because it's so, agriculture is so important in Iowa, and we need people to understand it if, if they've never been on a farm. What more can I say, Claudia, about that? What's your favorite memory? My favorite memory? Well, you know, I, I have a lot of them. I, uh, I remember my first trip to the fair. I think I must have been about four years old, and my dad had a, a pickup with a crate of chickens on the top. He had slats through the, 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 uh, the, the box, uh, and, uh, and we had a couple Hampshire hog gilts in the, in, the, in the back and this crate of chickens on the top. And, and the first thing we did is we dropped the chickens off at, uh, which is now the 4-H uh, exhibit building. It used to be the poultry building. And just a huge, huge number of chickens in that building. I mean, these, ink, these uh, I forget what we call them, brooders or whatever. And then we went over and we unloaded those hogs. And then I slept in the pen with my dad. And we'd go up to Ma Hardin Brooks Cafe in the cattle barn and they served meals uh, family style. They passed the sweet corn around and passed the meatloaf around and the mashed potatoes, and I still like that stuff. <laughs> but, but at any rate, uh, and, and then, uh, then subsequently years, you know, I showed down there uh, cattle. I never showed hogs, but I did when I was little. But, and then I slept in the tie-outs. I slept in the barn. I, I had the first World Super Bowl uh, when they started that. And I, uh, you, you know, I've got I've got so so many memories that that I, you know, it's hard to pinpoint one favorite one, but but uh, you know, I uh, I have such a compassion for the for the fair because I I believe that it it provides uh, at least one moment or one day of joy for people that that uh, may have all kinds of troubles, and I've seen it in their faces and their eyes, the, the, the excitement and the enthusiasm and the, the, the self-esteem and so on that they get by, by entering things. And, uh, you know, I, I, just, uh, I just believe it is such an important part of, our, of Iowa, you know. Well, actually, we saw the first... Uh, one of its kind at the at the Minnesota State Fair, and but they had one that was uh, they had veterinarians performing uh, surgery and so on, you know, and uh, and spaying cats and dogs and minor, other minor surgeries, and they didn't have a uh, but but so we kind of got the idea, and then we saw it and uh, we saw another one similar to that in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and so we. 
we decided that uh, we wanted to do this, and, and we thought it would be so important in the education, as I mentioned, and, and, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we, we didn't just do, you know, we were already doing hot pigs down in a swine barn, but we wanted to do calves, we wanted to synchronize calf, uh, cows, and, uh, and get them to calve at the same time, and, uh, and, and the same with goats and sheep and, and everything. And, and uh, so, you know, we needed some, some money, and, uh, and uh, I, I uh, visited with Bill Knapp about it, and uh, he provided the seed money to, to get it, to make it real, make it happen, and uh, in, in honor of his brother Paul. Well, it's 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 interesting you say that. I um, I've given uh, a couple. Uh, I've been asked to do a couple seminars at our national convention, and uh, in Las Vegas is where the National Fair Associations meet. For, I mean, International Association of Fairs and Exhibitions, and. And then we've had, I've had, uh, you know, I've been invited to go down to Tulsa and to Minnesota and other fairs to, to talk to their boards about, you know, our foundation. And the one thing I found very interesting is they all think that there's some magic, you know? I remember this guy from Colorado calling me up and he had just started a foundation about, and I had talked to him earlier. I just, uh, and he had been in it about a, a year and a half. And he called me, he says, now, he said, when was it you first thought you got some momentum? How, many, how long did, you th did, did it take for you to think you first got some momentum? And I said, about 15 years. And, you know, I think he thought it was going to happen within 18 months. But, so, you know, that, that, that's the thing that most, mostly they, they want to start out well, I was with some guy from Arkansas State Fair the other day, and they thought they were going to raise $25 million in three months. And I said, you know, you've you got to set realistic goals. And, uh, but that's been the interesting thing about how, how many people just think that there's some magic formula to, to having a, a foundation. Uh, 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 you know, you had to have the people and the, and the believers and, the, you know, that the Wall Street Journal said you know I would guess one of them I would guess that one of them would be the Texas State Fair and uh, and uh, the other one uh, could be the Minnesota State Fair I, I don't I'm not sure I, I never did know who the other two were now there's a there's a big difference between you know like Texas State Fair I think last three weeks the Minnesota State Fair lasts a full two weeks in a, in a, in a city that, that is larger than the state of Iowa. And the Oklahoma State Fair lasts for 16 days. And so we can't compare numbers. You know, we get a million people, and they may get two million, but it's over a, a longer period of time in a bigger, in a, in a, in a larger uh, popula population uh, area. So. And, and the other thing is, is that I, I just was talking with somebody that was at the Texas State Fair, and they, they were so disappointed. They thought it'd really be something, but it's held in the Cotton Bowl. And uh, they said, well, all it was was a bunch of rides and stuff, you know. And uh, so that's a good question. I'm sorry, I, I probably should have never said that without knowing who the other two were, but, you know. Yeah, they, Nebraska. You know, first of all, and, and I've been, I was invited over there too, and I met with the governor, uh, Mike Johans at the time, and they, they wanted to know what they could do because they, they, their fair was just going downhill. I said, the first thing you gotta do is quit having a fair on the day Big Red's playing in town, right next door. And they did, they were having the fair when Nebraska was playing home football games. And the second thing you need to do is move it to the Quest Center in Omaha. You know, where you have a population basis. So no, what they did is now they, they, they have moved to Grand Island. So they're, so they're further and further away from the population and, and, and the 
potential thoroughgoers. And so this is what we did. We're, we spent a large part of our advertising budget this year trying to lure the people from Omaha to come to the Iowa State Fair. And we think it's going to work. And it's, when they went out to Grand Island, I mean, that's, that's the end of them. I, 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 wouldn't, I would guess they won't be very successful. You know. That's too bad because, you know, but, you know. Do you find parking a problem or do you like the idiosyncrasy of the canes that they have now? Yeah, you know, that's all. I, I don't know. I, I think those people that have the yards like it. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we've uh, worked very hard to try to, to address this problem. You know, we've got the park and ride out at Southeast Polk now, and of course at the Capitol, and, the, and I believe that, that we have another site, maybe in West Des Moines, that we're, we're going to have this year. But, but it, it, it definitely is a problem. There's no question about it. Uh, and and uh, but I don't know what we can do about it other than what we're, you know. But, you know, it's I, a lot of people that use the Capitol Park and Ride or, or coming from the north and, and east, the uh, southeast, they're very happy with that, you know. So. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate appreciate the good questions, and uh, and I hope that you'll I'll see you at the Iowa State Fair. <laughs>